We believe that all men have certain unalienable rights, yet many Americans do not enjoy those rights. We believe that all men are entitled to the blessings of liberty, yet millions are being deprived of those blessings, not because of their own failures, but because of the color of their skin. Probably didn't get anxious until two black policemen that I knew came to my home to tell me that they were going to be my security from the city. And then we started thinking, well, okay, maybe we need to have some concerns. Because we were not allowed to attend public colleges and universities, I knew nothing about Winthrop. So the first day I set foot on campus was the very first day I saw Winthrop. And it was indeed a very intimidating experience for me to drive up to Roddy Hall, which was the freshman dorm at that time, to see these huge white columns, which to me represented uh, the South of the past with plantations and the slavery. I'm Cynthia Player Roddy and I am professor of English at Clinton College here in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and I'm head of the liberal arts department there too. I was the first Afro-American student to enroll in Winthrop. I was married, had two toddlers, and I worked in the York District One schools at that time as an elementary teacher. My name is Dolores Johnson Hurt. I'm currently uh, retired from the Charlotte Mecklenburg School System, where I taught for seven years uh, French to high school students. I'm very active civically here in Charlotte. I work with the League of Women Voters, and I'm also very active with a 70-year-old organization called the National Association of Negro Business and Professional Women's Clubs. I was the first black student on campus as an undergraduate, Dr. Roddy attended graduate school in the summer prior, but Arnetta Gladden, who passed away and who was from Rock Hill, was the other black student on campus at the time. My decision to come to Winthrop was based on uh, something very practical because I wanted to get certification as a media specialist. This was the closest school with an accredited program. Growing up in the community, it was an all-white woman's college. This is the story of the Winthrop girl. Who she is, what makes her different from other girls, the part that Winthrop College plays in her life. Actually, I did not choose Winthrop. My high school guidance counselors chose Winthrop for me. They had been approached by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in 1964, its first year, to find bright students who they felt would be able to endure the rigors of desegregating public schools in the South. So they approached my parents. My mother in particular was a very forward-thinking woman, and she convinced me to attend Winthrop. The only help I got was from my mother. She paid my tuition for the first uh, six weeks of school, which was a loan, which I had to pay her back. Anything that's education, anything that's for social and cultural development, she always supported me. Uh, sent me to private school, um, made sure that I was exposed to books, art, music, drama. Um, and I had a teacher, uh, her name was uh, Mrs. Anderson Clark, um, Fedora Clark Anderson. And she uh, always said you need a background of reference. 
That means you need to be exposed to everything. And even back in segregated West End School, those teachers exposed us to the best music, the best literature. We were doing uh, math way above our grade levels. Our test scores, those um, test scores were better, you know, uh, and surprising because it was what we had been exposed to. I think there were at least 2,000 up to maybe 2,500 students at that time, all girls. I guess daily life was very similar to life on any other campus. We went to classes. Um, our socialization basically took place among ourselves, first between Arnetta Gladden and myself, and then we had Sue Merriweather come be the third undergraduate student at Winthrop. There was no overt discrimination that I could see when I was at Winthrop. However, um, there was a chill in the atmosphere. We were not necessarily intimidated after we were there. We went about doing what we were supposed to do, studying, getting decent good grades for the most part. Very little socialization with the other girls. Zy Beta, somebody in the Delta chapter has written a poem or they gave me a plaque or something that says, uh, The Invisible Woman. And I was invisible because uh, nobody talked to me, nobody acknowledged me, the students didn't. And I think because I had other classmates working there, that's where I spent my lunchtime with them, talked to them. I knew somebody who worked out on the grounds, I talked to them. I knew somebody who worked in the kitchen, talked to them. So I don't even think they knew who I was. I knew about Arnetta because she worked at the Selenies uh, with my husband. And um, she was also married to somebody who was in my, from my community, so I knew about her, but I did not know. And it was 25 years, the 25th anniversary, um, that the Black Alumni Association had an event, and all of us, we were together for the first time, all in one place. My fondest memories had to do with um, the Black girls being together on the weekend, uh, putting on our record player, listening to songs from that era, or late at night, we were able to get R&B music out of Nashville, Tennessee, where you had Aretha Franklin, Otis Redding, all those greats we could listen to late at night on our radio. We couldn't get them during the daytime. Annetta Gladden, who was from Rock Hill, knew just about everybody in town. And at one point, her dorm room faced the first fast food restaurant in Rock Hill. And so we would sit on a Friday night and peer out the window and she'd point out people she knew or, and she was very anxious to see who was dating whom and going to the, the fast food restaurant. One of the things that we really appreciated was that most of the workers in the cafeteria were black. Whenever we would go through that lunch line, they were beaming at us. They were so proud of us, so glad to see us come through that line. So that was one of the things that I remember much about life on campus at Winthrop. I think it was two years ago, I came back for the first time to a class reunion. Nobody in the graduate class came back, but the undergrads did. And I spent the day with those wonderful women. And they said they were 18 and 19 years old. They had no idea that this was a history-making thing. They were more concerned about, you know, coming to college, finding a husband, social things. And they didn't even realize a lot of times that there were black students on the campus. And I think it's just because of the fact that Winthrop did not go through a trauma to desegregate. It was done uh, very consciously um, with some forethought as to how it would be done and that it was going to be done peacefully. And if you look through the archives and look through the records, now there was some, when I read some of the letters from some of the alumni about don't let this girl in there, I'm 24 years old, okay? And some of the other things they were saying, uh, I think there were even some faculty members who didn't want this, you know. I 
I didn't understand the magnitude of what was happening around the country and in the South as far as the desegregation process was concerned. Um, I knew that we were doing something historic, but now as I grow older and have a much more historic perspective about things, that was huge. It was a movement and revolution in this country. The magnitude of what we did during that time, I think I appreciate more and more as I get older. Only very recently have begun to appreciate the significance of it. Didn't realize that I really was taking my life literally in my own hands because there were people um, who just were so opposed. They were blowing up houses, blowing up churches, uh, people losing their jobs, economic political reprisals, all that kind of stuff, really didn't have any idea. But because I've talked to some other graduates, some younger alumni who come back, and who told me what a difference it made that they could have this choice of coming to Winthrop. But also it impacted the faculty. We got black faculty members, we have, we've had black vice presidents, Winthrop, and I'm sure that at some point in time there'll be a black president. It wasn't a conscious political statement. It was done for practical economic reasons, but it has had an enormous impact. Winthrop, I think, has one of the highest rates of minority students in state in the universities, and probably retention and graduation rates among the highest. So it has made a, a, a big impact. And it made an impact on my life, too, because it provided me with economic security. I'm extremely proud to have made a contribution in terms of desegregating Winthrop. However, it is amusing to me now when I go back on campus for a forum or something like that, and the students hear that you were the first undergraduate at Winthrop, first to be accepted. They are astounded. I, I'm seen as a relic. <laughs> I'm a relic to them. They can't fathom that I'm still around after being a student at Winthrop in, in, the, in the middle to late 60s. I'm just really, really honored, really, to have been chosen because I was chosen to play this role in history.